And now I'd like to hand it off to my partner in crime, Rohan. <laughs> As I've said before, my name is Rohan Gandhi, and I am a cell phone addict. <laughs> Let me take that back. My name is Rohan Gandhi, and I had an unhealthy relationship with my phone. Let me take that back again. Because neither of those things are really true. When we look in this modern day and age of cell phones, we think, oh, the phone is so bad, it's destroying our social skills and what on and so forth. But when we really look at it closer and try and move past just the shouting arguments back and forth, what's our real relationship with our phone? And is this so-called addiction as bad as we think? Well, first let's look at the term addiction, which is some sort of compulsive behavior, both a physical and psychological connection to a substance or device. Uh, I wanted to highlight this mainly because there's a lot of debate in the scientific community over whether or not our connection to our phones should really be considered an addiction. There have been people who have been diagnosed with phone addiction, they've been going through treatment, but there are also scientists who feel that this takes away from the real problems of addiction, especially a hard physical one to a substance like cocaine or nicotine. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I'll refer to it as an addiction sometimes, but it's something to keep in mind and be aware of when we just toss around this term so casually. And the reason I chose phone specifically instead of like social media or the computer is because the phone is, I think, the first combination of all of these things. We've come a long way since 1973 Motorola's, which are about yay big. And to the, what I consider one of the most influential inventions, the 2008 Apple iPhone, because for the first time now, with a smartphone, we've been able to be constantly in touch with everyone else. Constantly connected, information at your fingertips, social networks, a proliferation of social media apps, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, kick. And you just see this explosion across people and the fact that it's so readily available right here takes you two seconds. And we do lose a lot of things with this. One of the first obvious ones is our loss of social skills. You'll see people, if you walk around the Conestoga cafeteria, at circular tables, tables that are designed to face your fellow peers and friends, and people are just on their phones all the time. See people who lack the social skills now to have a conversation outside of text and abbreviations. Secondly, you have our somewhat, again, addiction term. People who feel anxiety when they go without their phone. I'll admit, for a while, and still today, I can feel it sometimes if I know my phone is in another room. We have things like sleep loss, insomnia, people who are being kept awake by the bright light from their phones. And finally, you have things like physiological conditions like carpal tunnel or radiation from the phones, things that are affecting us that humans were not designed to do. And part of this is true to an extent. I'll share a little story with you guys how Snapchat almost ruined my life. So who remembers back in the good old days when we had these kinds of best friends lists? My constant idea was checking what no, what's my score? Who are my top three best friends? Who are those best friends' best friends? How does their number three relate to my number two? My number one relate to their number three? My number one relate to their number one? Their number one relate to my number three? It's a little overwhelming. And the idea is that you keep getting notification after notification after notification. Keep checking, 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 on and on. And then Snapchat introduced one of its more famous innovations, emojis. Now, who here has been a victim to being overly concerned about the emojis on their Snapchat? All right, a sizable number. I'd say for me personally, part of it was wondering, oh, who do I have a smirk with? Who is my best friend but not their best friend? Where's my golden heart at? And most importantly, what I think are the streaks. I got a little bit obsessive with streaks. It would be constantly, one more, one more day, one more day. I would Snapchat people literally just the word saying streak to keep just some LED light on my phone to the next numerical sequence. And when I realized it had gotten too bad was when I would start texting people an entirely separate form of communication 
solely for the purpose of keeping a streak alive. I would literally text them, check Snapchat. And what we see though is that those effects that I described from Snapchat, they come from some underlying cause. But what we often do is forget the other side, the other effects that the same cause can have. And so there's hard scientific research on attention span. If you heard Zach Brings talk earlier, he mentioned how it's shrunk to eight seconds. And the obvious natural reaction to that is our lamentation of our loss of ability to deeply focus on an issue. The fact that we can no longer just sit down, like a long research paper, dive into a topic, really take an in-depth look at it. But on the flip side, what we don't realize is pattern recognition. So in Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, he talks about the idea that when you have a large amount of information, you need to find the thin slices that will lead to a useful result. And when you're given such information, a short attention span actually can help by finding what stands out to you and then linking those, that what that stands out to another piece of data and another piece of data. And when you find that pattern within those, it's a skill that can really be useful with things like law, things like economics, and just a vast variety of areas. We go to another example, the availability of information. <laughs> Google is about the same age, I'd say, as the average age in this room right now. And what you guys have seen is that as you've grown up, Google has also grown up from what was originally just a phone book of websites to now an amazing search engine, algorithms that are powerful enough to find that exact song that was stuck in your head just by typing in da 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 da. If you want to find information on anyone, if you find the weather, you can use it as a calculator. And all this information is within just like five seconds. Pull out your phone right now, swipe the passcode in, and search something. It's right there, available. And what's happened is we've lost our curiosity and imagination from that. People no longer take the time uh, to go read a book, research into a topic. But again, that's the aspect that's shattered about. The one that we often forget is diversification of our knowledge base. So to break this down, instead of like diving deep into one area, you're actually spreading across the surface. And so you may dabble in like history, culture, art, science, math, logic. And by creating this network across the top of information, and our ability to recognize patterns, it actually becomes easier to find solutions by using a different approach, by looking across your knowledge base, picking out the information you need, and using our technology to gain that information easily. And finally, what we were talking about earlier, our grown dependence and our idea of phone as an addiction. The DSM-5, which is essentially psychology's list of disorders, has many of the same like many of the symptoms of addiction are the same with your phone, like compulsive behavior, checking it even though it has an adverse effect or it's damaging your life otherwise. But then even if we claim, all right, let's say for the sake of argument, we are addicted to our phones, you have to remember also phones aren't going away and we are entering a new age where technology is reigning supreme. And by using our phones, using these interfaces, people now have like a vastly easier expertise with finding information, using our technology. And this is something that's going to carry into the future and a lot of people are already like their own little phone experts. But we talk so much about the new age. What about the old age? I have a few newspaper headlines I want to share with you. A few that stood out to me. A hundred years ago, it took so long and cost so much to send a letter that it seemed worthwhile to put some time and thought into writing it. Now we simply fire off a series of short notes, one here followed by another, from 1915. Another one, 30 pages in a uh, magazine article is too much. Then it became 15, and then condensed, shorter and shorter, because people can only accept a certain amount of information. It's from 1894. We go again, our modern family gathering silent around the fire, each individual with his head buried in his or her favorite magazine and the somewhat natural outcome of banishing social interaction, 1907. <coughs> Does this sound familiar? Let me key you guys in on a little secret. We've not had a total catastrophe of our social order since 1907. The world as we know it and society as we know it have not come to a sudden collapse. And when we look at our phones today and think of all the social effects, we have to consider is this really something very good, very bad? 
Or is it more that something just different? So does this mean that we should continue using our phones on and on ad infinitum? That we should live in some sort of paradise and euphoria of always being connected and never have to disconnect? Before you use this as an argument with your parents about using your phone too much, let me qualify it a little bit because of fitting into society. When I mentioned my Snapchat example, I didn't mention the fact that I have friends who are on both sides of me. Friends who continue to just Snapchat me the word street to keep it alive. But then others also who have given up Snapchat entirely and decided they don't want to be bothered with that kind of overload. And what happens is, Everyone has their own definition of what is acceptable use. I found mine after I started texting people to keep a streak alive. Other people have their own definitions. I mean, some people, like Anna right now, feel it's fine to just use their phone in the middle of a talk. Others have put it away for good and are uh, no longer using it even in school, trying to keep it at home the entire day. What happens is, when we think of our values as a society, they're the sum of individual values. And this idea of creeping normalcy, like say 15 years ago, no one had any idea what the word Facebook meant. But when one person starts using it, and then another, and then another, and another, our values as a society change because they're just the sum of all of us individuals. And that means you, each and every one of you, are currently defining what we as a society think is okay. I wanna share a quote with you, Kyle Chaika from the Pacific Standard. I don't think it's so much that we can't focus on reading a novel, so much as our perception of what media is engaging and entertaining has completely shifted toward the dynamic rather than the static. This isn't a bad thing, so much as it is in a fact in the gradual evolution of culture. Gradual evolution of culture. Each one of you today, by using your phone more or less, is redefining what we value it as a culture as a whole. And when we want to redefine our attitude, rethink what, as a culture, what's important, there's a few things we have to do. And so first is recognizing the gray area. So now I think you've heard arguments on both sides, should toss away our phones, go back to a pre-phone days, and also people who think, let's constantly stay connected, there's nothing wrong with that. But when you move past those black and white stances, you find the gray area in between and recognize the continuum that you're a part of, you can finally see that there is a way to moderate your usage. Instead of taking one strong side or the other, there is a way where you can find a happy balance. And the thing is, that's gonna be different for other people. There aren't, there isn't a homogenous society value, again, it's the sum of individuals. And individuals are different, and when we recognize that, we can move past the idea that one person always has to be doing this, and that's the same for everyone. You're all using your phone 40 minutes between this hour and this hour every day. But what you can do is find your personal balance. And that's what I want you to come away with most, that we can't tell everyone what to do. We can't change society all at once. But if you find the balance that's best for you and your social life, that if you find the balance that works for what you want to do and how you want to live, then that's going to affect society as a whole and hopefully for the better. And what I want you to think is not, oh, you should use your phone like five minutes on the hour for this amount of time. What I want you to do is consider these arguments and take a deeper thought next time that you pick up your phone. Thank you. Questions? Anyone? Yeah. Someone last period uh, asked Zach Frank, like, what, at what age, if you were a parent, you would give a kid a phone? And I'm now asking you, at what age would you give a phone? I don't think you should trust me with a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think I'm responsible enough to raise a kid right. Um, at a phone, have a phone, I'm not sure. I think I definitely have a longer period where they're using just a regular flip phone instead of a smartphone. Do you think uh, before and after this TED talk uh, that your cell phone usage time has changed? Like, has this talk made you... Uh... Yeah, I mean, so that's a good point. I've been wanting to do this talk for a while now, and I started collecting some information on it. Um, I think it's definitely shifted. Someone a previous time asked, like, what's your cell phone usage now? 
in the next uh, week, I think, I'm going to download an app that will start tracking my individual usage. So if you're curious about that, you can come find me later. But it definitely has made a difference in that sometimes I'll just put my phone away and think I'm going past my personal balance right now. And that has helped me reshape my attitude. So, Decided to do this. Honestly, part of it was my parents always said, oh, you're using your phone too much. You're using your phone too much. And then when I really thought about it, I was thinking, am I really? And thought about the idea that, is it really such a bad thing? And so I was actually on the part of the idea that we should keep using it whenever. It's not a problem. But then through this research, I found like the idea that you need to qualify it. You need to find your balance. What is the extent to this like, circumstance in our area compared to the global? Compared to global? That's actually an interesting point because you'll see even in like, a lot of city slums, people may like, not have enough food per week, may not have like, decent housing, but a lot of them will still have phones or computers. And that's part of the idea of the information age. We are all connected. And it's becoming a bit of an equalizer. But I mean, obviously, in different situations, like on the main line, for example, you're much more likely to have a more obsessive relationship with your phone as opposed to a different society or a different culture where there's different values. You know? uh, I know you don't have an iPhone. Do you think that's going to you at all? Like, iMessage I don't have enough friends who use group chats, so not really. <laughs> uh, all right, thank you.